a modern civil service. A modern civil service. A modern civil service. To me, a modern civil service is one that's ready to lead the UK through the next big challenges. People that reflect the society that we serve, designing services built around the customer to deliver the outcomes they need. Skilled. Innovative. Ambitious. A modern civil service. Welcome everybody to the Modern Civil Service podcast. Today, we have some very special guests talking about learning and development and leadership in the civil service. My name's Sapna Agarwal, and I'm the Director for Modernization and Reform. And very excitingly, I'm joined by Pamela and Natalie, who are going to introduce themselves now. Hi, Sapna. It's lovely to be here. I'm Pamela Dow, and I head up the Government Skills and Curriculum Unit, and we're responsible for three big uh, uh, aspects of the reform agenda. The Fast Stream and Emerging Talent um, uh, programmes, the Campus and Curriculum programme, which I'm going to say a little bit more about, and the Leadership College for Government, which Natalie's responsible for. Uh, hi, also delighted to be invited onto the podcast, so thanks for that. I'm Natalie Golding, I am the Director of the Leadership College for Government, and as Pamela Miller was saying, uh, we run programmes for leadership and, de- leadership and management for civil servants and the wider public sector as well. Brilliant, thank you, and thank you for joining us. Um, before we get into the details about the campus and the leadership programme, um, I was keen to ask you about what kind of leaders are you? How would you describe your leadership style? Gosh, <laughs> it's the worst question, isn't it? This is like an interview question. Um, Sorry to keep up. <laughs> no, no, bad vibes. Not, not at all. Um, uh, the problem is that I've I've just never had any uh, filter at all. So um, I, I, I think, and I think the official term for that is an authentic leader. That I know no other way to be apart from like me. So I'm probably do overshare. I'm not very good at hierarchy. Um, but I, th- I think the word we use for that now is authentic. Authentic. And I and I do think you can if you are if you if you treat people like adults they behave like adults if you tell people the truth they will uh, guard it in confidence um, and I, I, as I say I know no other way to be <laughs> Natalie oh well Pamela stole my answer <laughs> um, I do think it's important to be authentic I think I recently described myself as the Swiss Army knife of leaders because uh, my I'm really uh, flexible and adaptable um, which can be really confusing for people if they're not expecting that because it looks like you're flip flopping sometimes but all it is is that whatever my team needs, that's what I want to give them. So sometimes they need a bit of tough love, sometimes they just need things moving out of the way for them. So whatever they need, that's the thing I'm trying to bring to them as authentically as possible. Brilliant. And just, How about you? Oh, um, great question. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't expecting the tables to be turned. Um, I would say I am a, a direction setting leader. I think that I'm... Uh, I hope to sort of inspire people about the end goal and then sort of support them to get there themselves. I'd say that's my style of leadership. Pamela, I'm sure there's lots of civil servants that are listening to this who might think that they've heard all before. Why should they care about the government campus? What, what's different about this learning and development effort? It's a really good question, um, Sattler, and before embarking on this, you know, back in 19, uh, 2019, 2020, I did spend a good few months reading everything I could lay my hands on regarding, you know, skills and training of civil servants, but, you know, because Michael Barber says in his uh, work, you know, before there's nothing new under the sun, someone will have tried to solve this problem before. So, you know, right back to the 1918 Haldane Report, 1968 Fulton Report, a great read if someone's looking for some beach <laughs> reading, you know, Richard Wilson in 1999, Civil Service reform, Francis Maud in 2012, you know, the NAO skills report, you know, there's been all this, um, uh, you know, work done on this precise um, issue. Um, And it's astonishing to see the consistency, even right back to Haldane and Fulton, honestly, you can take passages out of Fulton and Haldane, and they could almost have been written yesterday about getting external expertise in, and more focus on science and technology, and um, they didn't say digital then, but, you know, they they meant it. Um, (laughs) uh, And, you know, so reading all of that, cynic might be tempted to just sort of think oh for goodness sake we've been trying to solve this problem for hundreds of years how will we do it this time but you know I'm an optimist and a pragmatist um, and every generation does have to make their new case for change and sort of you know bring make make it relevant and real for this generation of civil servants and respond to a new context and the dangerous thing I think is to assume that others haven't attempted to do this uh, and then not learn from them and um, so you know the, the the campus and curriculum program did did draw on 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 the lessons of the past 
Now I've got some four reasons that I think we can be hopeful. We've never had a curriculum before. We've never actually put it into the into precise strands as we've done with the five strands of the curriculum. Bit of a plug there. there you know, if you go on the go on the gov.uk site for the for the whole campus program, you will see them. Um, and it is hard. It's hard to come up with something that's meaningful for a workforce as big as ours but just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't have a go and the strands try and cover you know the universal stuff that's relevant to everyone wherever you are right through to the specialist and domain specific specific skills and knowledge so you know we've never done that before um uh, and you know hope you know i i hope that is something that has, that has found its time and that is meaningful and has and has longevity um and it seems to be it seems it seems to be something that's really taking root you know it isn't owned by us or the, the concept of the curriculum framework is owned by us at the centre but it's it's I'm noticing now in workforce learning strategies all across government that people are using that framework for their own purposes which is exactly what should be happen second reason to be hopeful is you know I think I've said it I've said it before there's this shared recognition cabinet secretary a range of ministers you know current CDL Kit Mulhouse but also Steve Barkley and Michael Gove before him Jacob Rees-Mogg they're absolutely committed to this in the same way so that that, that and that matters that sort of continued um uh, senior senior focus on it third reason to be hopeful is it's not just government that's thinking about this at the moment you know I, I'm, I'm sort of a, a surprised and delighted by just how much interest there is in what we're doing from businesses i mean i was asked to go and speak to the swedish british chambers of commerce <laughs> about a focus on learning development no don't laugh it's a it's a it's a brilliant uh, network of really important massive organizations who are also recognizing that we've slightly neglected you know continuing profession continuous professional development and 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 training in in every sector and also interest from other governments um in what we're doing in the uk and then the final reason to be hopeful is as you know as i, as I, as I said when we, when we opened up um we're on a bit of a burning platform aren't we <laughs> we you know we, if we're going to be smaller we have to be more skilled more capable um and there are new you know, new, difficult, knotty challenges facing the country, facing the world that, you know, we have to respond to as a, as a government, as a public service. Um, so we, we have to get this right. Um, can I also just clear up um, some, some technical words? Uh, Natalie, you mentioned leadership and management. What's the difference? Oh, well, uh, it's a really good question. And... Um, Anybody who's obviously read the prospectus cover to cover, which I'm sure all the listeners have, mm-hmm. uh, of the new prospectus that was published earlier this year for the college, uh, will have seen the quote uh, up top, which was management is doing the right thing. Do, sorry, management is doing things right uh, and leadership is doing the right things, uh, which I really love as a quote. Um, I think it's, I was thinking about this a lot on the way here because we do want to make a real push for both leadership and management. It's very distinct skill sets. And for me, I think there is something about what I was saying earlier about my style of leadership. For me, leaders are, they're setting the direction, which also sounds a bit wishy-washy to some people, but they are kind of pointing the team in the space or the, to pursue a particular objective, but it's the managers who actually get things done. If I just think about it a different way, a really good manager, if they step away from their team, their team keeps running uh, and they probably don't need to lean on their leaders as much as um, people who maybe don't have that skill set as well developed. Uh, so uh, I guess managers are really essential to getting things done and leaders are really essential to just making sure everybody's pointing in the right direction. And would you say in the civil service we have lots more leaders than we do managers? Do we need more leadership skills and management skills? What, where are we in this journey? So Pamela might have a different answer, I'm not sure, but um, I think I think both are necessary. I personally think there's been too much emphasis on leadership and everybody wants to be a leader. I think leadership comes at all levels. It doesn't have to be somebody who's really senior, somebody who just shows some innovation and changes things for the better in their area, however um, discreet that might be, I think is a great leader. But I think managers are really key to making things happen. Um, Too many leaders who are out there kind of making lovely speeches and publishing lovely documents and sort of talking about ambitious uh, visions for the future does leave the risk that those things never actually happen. So I think, um, I don't know if it's more, but certainly better managers who are, whose skills and contributions are better acknowledged and appreciated is definitely what the civil service needs. And I know there are loads of people doing those jobs out here, right, out there right now, but they don't get quite the same time in the limelight that leaders do. 
That's, I mean, I can't, I can't um, uh, uh, better that. I mean, when, when we first started thinking about this whole agenda, um, the, the two most important things were clarity and parity. So parity of status, um, because what we... And it's not distinct to the public sector, but we are coming out of a period when, you know, you see it on um, TED Talks and on LinkedIn, there's a lot of people talking about the qualities of leadership and theories of leadership. There's far fewer talking about the skills and precise knowledge, practice, of managers when you're trying to run the country it's actually managers who are you know who are making sure things happen as Natalie said you know leaders will design the vision they'll inspire people around the vision but managers are delivering the goals they're accountable they're managing risks leaders might take risks and you know and, and, and aspire to you know ambitious innovative ways of doing things but the crucial thing is that both are necessary and I think in our kind of you know in our culture we've 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 done this sort of thing that quite opt- often happens this sort of sheep and goats division you know everyone wants to be a leader really because being a manager is not very sexy so we are about making management sexy again <laughs> amazing so could you share a couple of tips for for listeners that are line managers what could we all be doing to be more effective line managers uh, so I'm, oh, this is the obvious place, thank you, Sabna, <laughs> for me to plug our brand new management pathways from the college, which are being designed and piloted right now. So the first uh, level, the foundation level, is already available for people to book onto with whichever department they're in. Um, we've got three more coming uh, between now and the end of the financial year in March. Um, so I would definitely recommend that people have a look, take a good long think about what their development needs are and pick the right pathway for them. Um, I think more generally, it's definitely worth really having a good think about what you're good at and what you're not good at and what your team is good at. And then the, the gaps in between that, those two things uh, is probably where you want to focus your attention. So I, I don't think people should necessarily try to be good at everything, which I think is something we often try and tell ourselves that if once you've like fixed this skill and you move on to the next, the next, but actually at some point you have to accept, I'm really good at these things and I really want to be good at these things, but actually there's a whole host of stuff where my team's better or my manager's better or my peers over there are better. Uh, so I think a really good manager is quite focused on where they can add the most value as a manager. And again, unsexy, but it shouldn't be. Um, I think they, they really need to focus on how things are done. Uh, being a good manager is sometimes about doing things in the right way, however boring or tedious that might be, because actually that's how you do things the right way. And it's doing that with a bit of humanity, not just a kind of computer says no or process driven approach, but really remembering that people are at the heart of everything you do, but really bringing some rigor and structure to that because that's what people need, particularly in their worst moments. Thank I you. think the revelation I had as well was that, um, uh, you know, a lot of clever people have worked out how to do certain things. You know, they all, both leadership and management are both art and science, but we've kind of forgotten the science bit of management. There are, you know, there are ways to give good performance feedback. You can learn them. They're completely teachable um, and there's ev- they're, they're evidence-based. There are ways to recruit fairly. There are questions that really work well for interview. And, you know, we shouldn't be embarrassed about the fact that if you don't know those things you won't be good at them so learn them and practice them and then you'll get better and I think sometimes people are insecure about whether they're a good manager or not because they 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 haven't they haven't sort of ever been told hey there's a canon out there of learnable things that will help you manage people manage projects manage budgets Um, and then once you've sort of nailed the non-discretionary bit of knowledge then you can apply your own style and your own sort of you know flexibility around it but there is an actual knowable there's a knowable body of knowledge (laughs) absolutely um so the way you're describing management is feels like it's more about managing a team that maybe you run do you have any tips for listeners on how you manage upwards uh so i um got put on the spot at one of the civil service live events when alex chisholm answered this very question and threw me under the bus in the nicest way possible uh, by saying that when I'd worked for him, uh, I had this habit of kind of asking him questions in a very gentle way, but which were actually really quite pointed. Um, so sort of just checking in with him as in, oh, are you sure you want to handle it in that way? Which was a signal for, you really don't want to handle it in that way. I've got some advice on how to handle it better. I think what's, what's, what can be sometimes tricky to understand, especially when you've got somebody who knows their subject, uh, is really passionate about it, just wants to see the right thing done. It's really easy to run in there head on and go, no. 
Um, very few people like to hear the word no, even if they've got the best of intentions themselves. So it is very much about understanding where that senior person is coming from, remembering that they're human too. Um, so they might be stressed, they will have their own little flaws, um, they will be nervous depending on the subject matter or the portfolio. There might be some really big stuff at stake for them as well as for the project. So just bearing all that in mind and uh, engaging with them as human to human is really, really valuable. Um, and people prefer it generally when you don't just say no, or that's wrong, or that's stupid, but ah, I can see what you're trying to do there. I thought you might want to try doing it this way instead. So offering a, at least a part of a solution or the pathway towards a different way of doing things is often the most valuable way to, to kind of get the outcome you're looking for. There's two there's two bits of my CV that I'm so I'm so grateful I did and it was more by kind of luck than design as often happens with CVs. So I started off as a graduate trainee consultant and learning client service skills at a really early stage of your career. Um, I think you know I still apply client service skills in whatever role I'm ha- um, I, I, I'm in. And your manager and your leader they're a client and you think to yourself as you do in a consultancy what does my client need from me what am I delivering to my client how can I see the world from my client's perspective and you know actually earn my even though there isn't a sort of commercial incentive in the in the relationships uh, uh, outside consultancy um, uh, frameworks um, how can I apply this sense of I, I, I am justified in my um, uh, in my service that I'm providing because I'm I'm, I'm I'm satisfying my clients needs so client service skills I think are really and then again you don't have to be consultant to acquire clients over skills there's loads of you know there's loads I think we've got some um, um, and modules on the framework about client service skills um, and then the other thing is private office as Natalie said you know I, re- I always recommend anyone to spend some time even if it's just a day shadowing someone because once you've worked with a minister or, or a senior principal and th- and thought about their the world from their perspective you know the, 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 the commodity in the shortest supply is their time and decision making and it's in the highest demand so manage Managing that flow of information and time, and um, that just gives you such empathy and understanding into how you then take things to them, you know, and thinking, if you've got 30 seconds with a minister, every second that you waste is a second of time that that minister could be doing something more important. <laughs> um, so, you know, using every single second, every single word in a document well, because it's a sort of disrespect to them if you don't. So both of you just mentioned working in private office and you just mentioned, um, Pamela, um, shadowing. Um, For those listening that haven't had the opportunity to work in private office, uh, should they just email somebody in private office and ask if they can come and shadow? Does that happen? Is Is that possible? Yeah, so I think every department will have a slightly different setup depending on, well, just what, how they, how they run it. But pretty much every private office is desperate to have people. There are <laughs> exhausted private secretaries everywhere looking for people to cover them for up to a couple of weeks and sometimes just for a few days. Um, and they off- a lot of private offices as well, a lot of departments will also run a kind of shadowing either of their boards or their kind of most senior officials. Um, so if you email the kind of administrative part of your private office, check the internet. There's usually details on there about cover schemes. Um, it will be... I don't know what department wouldn't have a scheme like that in place somewhere. And it doesn't have to minister. It's you know the perm sex private office, a senior official, head of an ALB. There are so there are so many other private offices, other than ministers that will just give you an insight into how to manage that principal's time. And it, so I was going to say, it, it it doesn't hurt to just uh, take the initiative as well. So I. This is my first SES2 job, um, so I was really stunned that there were people in my team who wanted to volunteer to cover my executive assistant when she went on leave, but they just sort of thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, so just email speculatively, and usually that will almost never get turned down. So what can you say to people listening, but they've not felt the effects yet? Um, what can you know what can we all as individuals expect from the campus um and if we've not felt the changes yet when 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 will we it's a really, really fair point. And I knew, you know, back to, in 2020 that you know, we, we, we had to do two things in parallel. We had, to, we had to really invest in the infrastructure. So civil service learning, you know, we don't need to talk about it here, but no one thinks it's very good. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 it does the job it, in terms of, you know, compliance products. 
if you need a first aid course, if you you know if, if you need a sort of basics in da- information security. But when you look at you know if it just Google Civil Service College Singapore, you know when you look at what a really really sophisticated learning platform looks like for an organisation, you realise just how far away away you are from that. We are working, you know, round the clock. There are some brilliant people, a virtual team across, you know, government business services and uh, um, uh, uh, our unit and other bits of government trying to get to where that, to, you know, to that quality of platform. It'll be a while. <laughs> but, but what we had to do in parallel is some illustrator projects that just, as you say, made everyone's life just a little bit better. And, you know, I would hope that... Um, yes, okay, 450,000 people won't have seen the benefit of it, of it yet, but the, the, in, the, the, the induction masterclass, the, in, the, the, the sort of universal civil service induction, I think we're up to sort of 7,000, 8,000 people already. Um, you know, that will continue to grow this year. And, you know, that, that, that hasn't existed before. It's a really good product on a really great WYSI platform, and it just gives everyone the sort of basics in what it means to be a civil servant. And the there's other versions of that. We've got the um, data masterclass, you, the innovation masterclass that we worked with with you. You know, there's much more um, uh, recognition with our the campus networks across government of 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 where um, duplication can be can be reduced because you know every department has to have a lot of their own um, uh, knowledge and learning. Every profession has to have a, a lot of their own. But there's loads of stuff that's common to everyone um, and and we are we are you know um, uh, it, it working on ways to make sure that everyone can access the best of what's going on across all departments but it's a it's a generational shift isn't it I've spoken too much I'm gonna let Natalie come in <laughs> well uh, maybe question for you Natalie how does this all fit together so you guys are doing amazing work sitting in the cabinet office but looking across government and then in departments you've got um, people that will be thinking about leadership and le- thinking about learning and skills how does it all come together and if somebody's you know sitting in a department how does this offer affect the offer that they're getting um, from their own learning and leadership teams uh, so the key thing is that it's additive rather than duplicative um, and that will come become more and more obvious over time obviously it's a work in progress at the moment but what the college in particular does is bring together a number of different teams and programs into one place so that people don't have to go searching around trying to find the thing that they're looking for um, we're obviously focused on leadership and manage but the campus as a whole will will at that end vision stage that Pamela and I are leading the team towards um, be that kind of almost one-stop shop for those cross-cutting really core bits of learning but we reckon, you know, we're not teaching people how to be accountants or um, tax inspectors or uh, security um, uh, uh, inspectors. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, what we're doing is giving people those core foundational skills that they'll need in almost every team, in almost every department. But absolutely, departments still have a huge role to play in creating those really specific skill sets that they require in house. Um, and so. That end state, uh, we'll be working completely harmoniously with de- with departments to create that really broad offer where people know where to go and what to go for and have a choice between those core foundational skills and that more specialist learning that they need in particular roles or teams. Um, so both of you have um, just mentioned kind of the end state. You, uh, Pamela, you have mentioned Singapore. Could you paint a picture of what the civil service might look and feel like when we've really got kind of leadership Um, skills, all of these things kind of nailed, however we describe that. How will things look and feel different at a civil service level and how will it look and feel different for the individual? So I think... um, And you can think big, this is (laughs) dreamlike. I mean, I think, well, I might actually think small to start with because um, the, I think sitting in the, you know, the position of uh, an official at a desk uh, and what's changed for me, all this all this chat about the new campus, the college, everything else, all these great new offers, what does that mean for me? And the truth is, you know, a good number of the products or the schemes coming out of the college are only ever going to um, touch a small number of people, you know, 30 to 60 directors going on our director programme, maybe 500, four or 500 people going on our future leader scheme. Um, the management pathway is different because everybody should have 
easy access to those in due course once they're all out there um, in the, over the next few months. But I think what it what it means is that people will know that they, there is quality, genuinely high quality learning that will actually give them practical skills that they can take back into their workplace day one, week one, and start using. I think that sounds really simple, but it's not something we have now. I don't recall having it in my sort of 16, 17 years in the civil service. Um, it's always been really patchy. It's always been really hard to find the right thing. Uh, when you do get something that's good, uh, you kind of tell everybody about it, but then it disappears. You know, those are the sorts of problems that we want to remove so that actually learning and development is enjoyable, practical, meaningful, contributes to the job, contributes to the individual, and isn't just isn't a complete ache for anybody to get on with. <laughs> I've heard um, some civil service leaders um, sort of echo what you're saying, Pamela, recently, that they really want to make sure that skills um, and training in the civil service is a real selling point to, to come here. Do you think that, that we're on track for that? Are you hopeful that we, in a few years, that, that will be part of our core proposition to people? Or is, is it the case that our learning and development is, is already pretty good compared to other employers we're just not accessing it as much as we should I think it's a bit of both I think I think we're you know as ever in I think I don't know if it's your two experience but I do think we're pretty self-flagellating in the civil service we're always talking you know and we should always be trying to improve but the the um in pockets across the whole landscape there are bits of brilliance and often the role at the cabinet office is just trying to sort of you know let people in one part of the system know what brilliant things happening in the other part of the system hence the concept of a, ca- a campus so I do think a bit of sort of just show and tell of what's what's available to people um, and again that's why you know I, 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 I am I'm determined that this whole agenda is an equality of opportunity agenda because I think if you are lucky enough to have a boss who emphasizes this and who is pushing you to apply to some of the leadership college courses or to really invest in your domain understanding or to attend loads of events so that you broaden your network you're laughing aren't you but you know you might just be in a position where that's not you know neither your boss is aware of what's out there nor you're aware of what's out there so there is this sort of um inequality that 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 exists um so um uh, i you know i do think there is an element of just better showcasing of what exists but there's also just some stuff that needs to be better and you know who knows what the future holds change is the only constant all i can say is well two things um i have never known a period a prolonged period of such emphasis on this you know the idea that 10 years ago the cabinet secretary would want to have conversations with me about scales like that just would that just didn't happen not because they didn't care about it but you know it just it just didn't have the same profile as it does now and also we kind of have to if we're going to be a smaller civil service we just have to be a better equipped and competent and confident one so we don't really have a choice (laughs) absolutely so talking about sort of being slightly smaller and um some of the problems and that we're sort of are coming our way so we're obviously already in a cost of living crisis it's i assume that it will only intensify um the government's got big ambitions around leveling up net zero lots of things that um we're going to have to tackle and for the the next prime minister whoever that is will probably still be top of top of their agendas how will kind of what we're doing on the campus um, on skills and what we're doing on the leadership college help us actually deliver on those big problems um, so I think it comes back to making sure that people have those gen- sort of basic foundational skills but that they're also equipped to I suppose as Pamela put it earlier they have the qualities and the behaviors as much as the skills and the knowledge to back that up so um, listening to Pamela talk about some of the learning uh, challenges and offers uh, the thing that comes back to for me is feedback so actually leaders who are equipped not just to be the confident leader sort of alpha out there in front of everybody charging into that uh, vision of the future but also have the wherewithal and the self-awareness to question whether they've actually looked down all the right avenues whether they've listened to the experts on their team properly whether they can actually pull all that different knowledge and information together from people who know better than they do and come to the right decision those qualities are just as important as having those some of those basic foundational skills and knowledge yourself and I think the, the, the ideal for the, for the leadership college, certainly, is that our programmes aren't just giving people 
information but they are giving them the skills and behaviors to use it and deploy it and to work through others to deploy it better as well so i keep talking about putting more bite and more challenge into it and what we need ultimately are leaders and managers who can accept and thrive on the basis of being challenged as well as having people sort of nod and agree with everything that they say (laughs) and that pay it forward point as well another mantra that we use that you know it's as natalie said you know the most respect you can give to someone is give them constructive feedback because you 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 just care about them being better and you care about you know it 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 should just be as you know satna from 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 being in consultancy it's not just a sort of nice thing you do twice a year give feedback it's just a constant you know that was brilliant here's how you could have done it differently here's how I've done it in my career you know that document you wrote for me here's why I've made these changes do you understand why I've made these changes and it's not just a that shouldn't just be a sort of oh some leaders do it and some managers do it and some don't it's absolutely your responsibility to do that as a leader or manager because you are responsible for the resilience of this institution if you're not paying it forward so the next generation coming up aren't good quality you're just you're you're negligent (laughs) Tough words, <laughs> tough words. Um, but uh, yeah, and just to add to that, I think it's the difference between learning and development or developing leadership skills being on the side and being a learning organisation. So things like giving feedback continuously is is the fabric of a learning organisation. I suppose that kind of your ambitions for learning, development, and leadership means that we do need to shift to being a learning organisation and and that means a culture change. And that might genuinely be the hardest thing for the civil service to do because that is, you know, you can put in all the programmes and the new content and the platforms and the channels as you you want. But um, ultimately it comes down to not going to a classroom for a day or a week or logging online for a half day seminar or workshop. It's do you have that drive to learn and do you have the support around you from your manager, your team and your organisation to learn? And I, I know everybody finds it challenging. It's really hard for senior people to go and spend two days away from their office and their phones paying attention to something that isn't the day job. Equally, you know, if you're at the front line of some of the hardest hit delivery organisations in the country, is your manager really in a position to let you go when there are so many public service backlogs? Um, but it's absolutely essential that people really do commit to that. And it doesn't have to be, I've got to spend a week here or a day there or half a morning here. I was, I was look, just looking at, reminding myself of a really great article that was in the FT a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's by somebody called Esther Bintliff. And if people have access to a corporate, um, a corporate account, it's an article that's worth a read because it's about feedback. It came out in July. And it is, it's a brilliant article. It takes like 10, 15 minutes to read. It genuinely sums up a brilliant uh, approach to giving and receiving feedback. And that kind of micro-learning, bite-sized, just continually, that is what lifelong learning means. It doesn't mean constantly striving to get onto the, like, the, the gold star program, which you may or may not like. It is, what's the thing that's going to benefit me, me and my team now? Go for that. I'm so embarrassed that I know about that article because my husband raised it while we were on holiday talking about our relationship, <laughs> oh my goodness. about feedback to each other, which I thought was really good. So that's yeah, we're, really we're, nice. we're practicing the tips. <laughs> Um, and Natalie, you mentioned earlier sort of the um, leadership college being sort of available to the wider public sector as well. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so one of the teams that is part of the college has been piloting uh, a scheme for CEO level, so you know, we're talking heads of NHS trusts, um, chief constables, top of their um, organisations across the country, um, and bring them together again to focus on building their um, leadership capability, but particularly their networks. And actually, uh, what we found is they really appreciated that time to kind of step away from the day job, think about some of those strategic challenges. I recognise the common challenges that they actually share, despite working in very, very different organisations, um, and and particularly build those professional relationships, both for professional development and learning, but also that professional support that you just don't get that often at the top. It's really lonely, some of these top jobs, really, really lonely and isolating. Um, so going forward, we want to really build on that and continue to build those networks right across the country, across those different organisations. Obviously, it's going to be a huge challenge, but we're hoping to be able to open it up a little bit more broadly as well so that we can at least focus on the next level down just to kind of build out that public sector uh, systems leadership um, a bit more strongly. Um, so final question, um, and you might need a, a, a few seconds to think about this. I'm going to sort of... Um, uh, really stretch the concept of the fantasy dinner party. <laughs> so, three you get three guests each. So, first of all, your favourite manager. 
second place, the second C is for a leader that inspires you. And the third place is for somebody, could be anyone dead or alive, that you would um, have liked to shadow for a day. If they're dead, like to have, and um, if they're alive, maybe we can try and make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I go first? Um, uh, so, um, favorite. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go in reverse order. So, I'm okay. reading a book called Queen of Spies at the moment, which is a which is a um, a biography of Daphne Park, who was just a legendary woman. She was in the Special Operations Executive during the war. Then she um, went out and she was um, uh, she was deep cover in the Moscow Embassy, sort of at the very beginning of the Cold War. Then she was in West Africa due through all that period of you know. Um, uh, uh, decolonization, so Congo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, she just—and you can imagine being a woman in that world. She had to fight some fights, and I'm obviously reading it from the point of view of, um, you know, how did she train for that? How did she acquire the skills she needed? Um, but yeah, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's called Queen of Spies, and she's called Daphne Park. Um, so she would be my—I would, you know, she would be my dream dinner party guest because it was—it's a, a life I would love to have had, um, and a bit scary at times. Uh, and and then the the in, inspirational leader. So I'm, I've got a bit of a girl cross on Angela McDonald. I love Angela. Um, so she is second poem, second HMRC, and she's just she's she's just she's always herself. She's always inspiring. She because she runs a really massive operational system. She you know she cares as much about the sort of you know um, the day to day details of you know how a thing gets done. Um, it, you know whether it's it's an event or a or a system change or a you know the the the, the very very um, complicated um, uh, ways in which um, uh, you, you know you train up a, 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 an HMRC advisor or a, you know she's a really big supporter of the apprenticeship program as well. So I think she would be my most inspirational leader. And she always she accepts any invitation to do anything to do with this agenda. So she makes time for it. So she is the epitome of paying it forward as well. Um, best managers are really difficult. And I think I'm going to be a bit. I mean, all all the managers in the government skills and curriculum are fantastic. But I just want a bit a bit of a shout out to. Um, Nick Walker, who heads up the campus uh, and, and curriculum team, and particularly the learning frameworks, because whenever I go into my inbox, there is uh, I am either cc'd or bcc'd into a bit of positive feedback that Nick has given one of his teams um, about something you know that's happened that day, that hour. He just takes the time to do it. And just going back to what we were just saying about um, about feedback, you know, for Nick it is a constant of his of his job. So I think he is the um, he is a he is a stellar uh, manager but everyone is everyone is in my area <laughs> brilliant thank you natalie um so i i'll start with the manager because that one's the easiest uh, by far so i had a manager um called phil west and i will name him because he's retired now and i don't care about embarrassing him um and he was uh, definitely a renegade wild card type um and on paper we were absolute opposites but we worked together really effectively and he eventually became a career sponsor and I absolutely know for sure I would not be where I am in my career without him um, and he for me he was just the best manager I could have had at that period um, in terms of uh, leader I'm this might sound like, like a slight cop out I was really trying to think quite hard like civil service or the wider kind of business or private sector world and actually it came back to I have some amazing women working for me and I've actually often found the most inspirational people to be the people that I get to know in my teams so my two top team leaders and I mean to be honest most of the people on my team but my two top team leaders and my um, EA are both phenomenal they all do volunteering they all have busy personal lives like the caring responsibilities they are doing it all and I genuinely don't understand how <laughs> <laughs> and they are absolutely phenomenal uh, at doing both their professional work and getting on with um, amazing personal achievements as well and they're all absolutely delightful people to boot I just I just don't know how they balance it um, and finally in terms of shadowing that was really hard because I'm really tempted to say oh, I don't know the chief executive of Coachella can you can you hook that up <laughs> um, um, but I think I, I would probably say I used to want to be a, a journalist or a writer because I, I really do admire the ability to communicate something um, often something boring or that doesn't necessarily seem interesting in a really engaging way. So if there were any way to be a fly on the wall while Bill Bryson is kind of, <laughs> you know, 
working on his many non-fiction uh, works of art, I would love to understand how he does it. Okay, we are going to try and make that happen for you, Natalie, because <laughs> um, that sounds like a very modern civil service, just making these kinds of opportunities happen. Um, so unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wrap up there, but I'm, I'm really sad to do so because I could talk to you both all day. Um, just before we wrap up, a um, quick question that we ask all of our panellists. What does a modern civil service mean to you? Um, Pamela, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, I'm going to steal a Netflix mantra, which is um, that everyone is um, 100% uh, accountable and 100% autonomous. I just wanted for our listeners to promise you that this is not sponsored by Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Pamela's husband so, works I, it. <laughs> I, I just love that idea of total autonomy, total accountability, and I think that is, if, if anything comes through from from the modern civil service, it's that you know you 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 are you are empowered to make the change. You're empowered to innovate but you also have the responsibility and the accountability for the consequences of that and I think where you see risk managed really well in systems it's when people feel personally accountable you know a prison officer manages risk in a way that you know is is more sophisticated than a lot of people with kind of you know 40 page risk logs in departments. Brilliant thank you. Natalie? Uh, So skilled, innovative and ambitious uh, and I'd add to that inspirational and kind of delivering for the people of the UK. Um, sorry, I can do it again, but I, I see this almost every day working with my team or working with the teams I work with across government. Um, and it's really easy to get distracted by people working on the biggest, you know, most high profile new policy priorities or delivery. Um, but frankly, when I look at what the best of my peers and my teams are doing every day, uh, getting on building their expertise, making really um, interesting big and small adjustments to work that save money or produce a better outcome and they're always, always, always striving to work to the best of their ability, their ability no matter what hurdles we put in front of them um, because they really do care about their colleagues and the people of the UK um, and so for me that's the bar for a modern um, civil service and I'm really lucky to be able to see that genuinely pretty much every day. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Thank you both for your time um, and thank you for your efforts. What you're doing on the skills and leadership um, agenda is amazing and I know that all of us are going to benefit from it. So thank you for for all your hard work um, and for joining us. Um, And if anybody listening knows someone that's living our vision of a modern civil service and has ideas to share or can provide brilliant examples of being more skilled, innovative and ambitious, please do get in touch. We'd love to feature you on the podcast. (laughs)